Let's go to the Lord in prayer again, and then we'll open our Bibles to the book of Colossians chapter 1. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, what a great praise to you it is that you have purchased a people with the blood of Jesus Christ and have in that purchase reconciled them to yourself, having forgiven their sins. Thank you and praise you that in time you work through the work of your Spirit in calling them, regenerating them, and causing them to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord who purchased them. And all of this to the praise of your greatness and glory. Help us not to lose track of this great truth in our day-to-day living, but cause us to be mindful of it throughout every day so that we would indeed live to the praise of your goodness and glory. Bless us this morning as we spend this time in your word. Strengthen our understanding. Enlighten our minds, we pray, Lord, and teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. Colossians chapter 1, and we'll begin in verse 9. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects. We'll stop there. As you are aware, we have spent much time looking at this incredibly powerful prayer of the Apostle Paul, a prayer divided into two parts. The first part, a part of thanksgiving to God for His grace that has come to these people, and ultimately His grace that has come to all of His people. What a praise that is, and what a right thing to pray. Thanks to God. Thanks to God. And really, in that little phrase, thanks to God, it sums up much of, if not all, Christianity. Because all things are from Him, through Him, to Him, and for Him. It's not about all of the world and all of the creation or even all of the people of God. It's ultimately all about God and His glory and His majesty. And we as the people of God are blessed to be able to acknowledge that and to know that and to, in a sense, participate in that willfully. What a great and high calling that is, and something really that is so profoundly clear in Scripture, but so often minimized in our day-to-day living. And perhaps whenever we step back and look at the profoundness of that ability to be thankful to God and to be a part of His work on the positive end, perhaps a failure to recognize that is... Well, it's certainly sin, and it may be a great, great sin in our lives. One that we would have to constantly plead for His mercy and forgiveness of in the practical sense. Because it is a great thing, a great, great thing to offer thanksgiving to God from a heart that has been changed by God. And the Apostle Paul does that here, and he's not only doing that just because of God's grace to him, but ultimately because he has seen that God's grace has come to these people at Colossae and has brought the gospel to them. 
And then the second portion of his prayer is his prayer on behalf of these believers here at Colossae. And we saw last week and the past couple of weeks that there are three parts to this prayer for them. For the people. First, it is indeed a request for them. He's praying for them. And we saw in that ninth verse, as we just read, that he is praying in particular for them that God will make known his will to them. Take a look at the text again with me. And for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we saw as we examined that phrase that you would be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding that that phrase, spiritual wisdom and understanding, while some consider it synonyms of the same thing, the two phrases, in reality, there are two parts to the same request here. And that is that you would have a spiritual knowledge or spiritual wisdom that is gleaned only from the Word of God so that you would possess the knowledge, that you would possess the wisdom, but not near, merely possessing it for the sake of possessing it. But that you would possess that, and notice this, and have understanding with it. And in these two phrases is the fact that God calls us to know sound doctrine from His Word and to obey it. Not just having a reservoir of knowledge for the sake of possessing that reservoir, but having that knowledge so that it impacts our lives on a day-to-day -day matter. In all that we say, in all that we do, wherever we go, whatever we do where we go, that God's Word is in our minds and hearts as Christians and we are in obedient to it. That we are seeking His wisdom on everything that we do, every decision that we make. It's very, very practical what Paul has in mind here. We saw in other places of Scripture in Paul's letters that he prayed for the saints. And he prayed similar things for them. That they would know God's will and that they would walk in obedience to it. Now this morning we come to the second part of this part of his prayer for the saints. Take a look at it. And it's intimately joined to the first. He says in verse 10, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. First the request, and now here at the beginning of verse 10, he gives us the reason for the request. So let's read them together once more. We have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Beloved, whenever you join those two phrases together, we see an incredible truth immediately spring out of there. Here is the ultimate reason for the necessity of knowing the will of God. That one might walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. You know, we often pray for the knowledge of God's will 
And we often pray for the knowledge of God's will when we pray for it, that we would have direction so that we would know what to do in certain circumstances, so that in those circumstances, as far as we could tell, we would be successful and be doing God's will. And really, there's nothing wrong with that. That's not against the Word of God. It's not against God. It's actually in line with God's Word and His will for us in seeking His will. But that's really not the ultimate reason behind, or should not be the ultimate reason behind, our asking God for knowledge of His will. And it's not the ultimate reason for knowing God's will. What is it then? Well, it's conveyed right here. It's to know His will so that we as His people will walk in a manner that is worthy of His Son. That is worthy of His Son. Basically, this is knowledge of the will of God so that we as His people will live in such a way as is worthy of the Lord. In actuality, a life that honors the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is not so as to merit Christ. It's not a, the idea of walking in a manner worthy of the Lord here is not to merit Him and not to merit His work, but rather to demonstrate, and this is critical, it is to demonstrate the very effect of the person and work of Christ on and in our lives, on our behalf and in our lives. We as Christians, we know from God's Word that we, there is nothing we can do to merit anything from God, especially with regard to salvation. But we can live in a manner that is worthy of the Lord in the sense of demonstrating the effect of Christ's death and His person in our lives as believers. In other words, because you are in Christ, what kind of person should you be? Well, we should be a person that demonstrates the glory of the Son, that is worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in particular, walking in a manner worthy of the Lord speaks to the character of one's life who belongs to Christ, having been changed by Christ Himself. So whenever we call out to know God's will, we should keep in mind that ultimately His will is for us always to walk or to live in a manner that honors Christ. And anything to the contrary is sin. So whenever we cry out for God to bless us with the knowledge of His will, we want in particular knowledge of His will so that in our day-to-day -day living, Christ every day is honored. It's not merely about our practical success. It's about the principle of Christ and who He is and what He has done on behalf of His people. This connection is repeated in multiple ways throughout Scripture. We're not going to look at all of them this morning, but I am going to call your attention to a few verses that are in essence demonstrating or conveying the same thing. And I'm going to ask you to go to a text we saw last week, and it's 1 John chapter 2 with me. And you'll see the connection. You, Paul will actually draw the same thing here in just a few uh, words or a few chapters, a couple of chapters from now where we are in Colossians, when he says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, if you've been risen with Christ, in other words, if you are in Him, you're raised up with Him, you're identified with Him, set your mind on things above. He says there is a connection that you have in Christ, and 
If you are in Christ and that connection is present, then your mind is to be set up on things where Christ is seated. It just makes sense. If you are a Christian and you are gleaning the will of God, it is for the purpose of walking in a manner worthy of Christ. You are connected with Him. He is in you. You are in Him. You need to know God's will so that you will walk in a manner worthy of Him. And by the way, before we look at this next verse, keep something in mind. You're not going to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord if you don't know God's will. It just stands to reason from this text. If we don't know God's will, as revealed in His written Word, then we're not going to know how it is that we are going to walk in a manner of the Lord, worthy of the Lord. And do you want to really wing that? Do we really want to just guess at whether or not we're walking in a manner worthy of the Lord? I don't think so. The stakes are too high. So in order to do that, we have to know His will. Take a look at 1 John chapter 2 with me and start in verse 3. By this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. The one who says, I have come to know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. You know, one of the incredible things about the short epistle of 1 John is the fact that it is very black and white. And John is just very straightforward in the statements. There's really no room for doubt here. He's very succinct and very clear in this epistle. And this is one of the examples. Notice it again. The one who says, I have come to know him. So if someone professes, hey, I know him. But that same person does not keep his commandments. There's only one conclusion. You're a liar. He's a liar. Don't, we don't have to mix this up and try to say, well, you know, maybe, maybe so, maybe not. Kind of, sort of, maybe not really. We don't know for sure. John doesn't go down that path. The Holy Spirit doesn't take his people down that path. He's very clear here. He's very succinct. If someone professes to know Christ and they don't obey Christ, that is, they are not walking in a manner worthy of Christ, that person is a liar. Now, we live in a day and age where that kind of speech is just not tolerated. Notice as verse 5 goes on. But whoever keeps his word, and it's actually building on uh, verse 3, but whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Walking, basically, as Paul says, in a manner worthy of the Lord. Take a look at the very last verse of this chapter. Verse 29. If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. We want to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. We need to know the will of God. And knowing the will of God will ultimately lead us to walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. They're intimately connected. If you are bound up with Christ, and all those who are Christians are indeed bound up with Him. They are identified with Him. They have been chosen in Him before the foundation of the earth, according to Ephesians 1, chapter 1, verse 4. Christ died on the cross. He gave His life for those sheep. They died with Him. They have been raised with Him. It stands to reason that they will then therefore walk in a manner of worthy of Him, and that will be as they know and understand 
God's will. Look in your Bibles to another text with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul is addressing the church at Corinth here. And he comes to this section in 1 Corinthians 11 where he is going to rebuke them because of a failure in their part to honor Christ in their profession and their deeds. Look at verse 17, 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions or that divisions exist among you. And in part, I believe it. And what he's saying is, uh, he understands as he'll communicate in the very next verse, that in the visible church, and you'll remember that the visible church as we've looked at on Wednesday night is composed of both tares and wheat. We're not talking about merely visible saints here. And we're not talking here about the universal church. All of which are only composed of those who are Christians. But whenever we come to the visible church, it's composed of wheat, those who are believers, and tares. It's just the condition of living in the world. There are those in multiple places, as we have seen, that will join themselves to the church that are not Christians. They join themselves to the church because for whatever reason they're impressed with it or something about what the church is doing is impressing them. But not on God's terms, on their own sinful terms. And Paul recognizes that that condition is going to promote at different times divisions. And he says, because he's aware of that, for in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part I believe it. And here's why he believes it. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. God is going to raise up out of the midst of that wheat and that tear condition those who are sound in their doctrine and make them evident. But that's not the ultimate problem that Corinth was having. Notice as he goes on. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I will not praise you. Skip with me down to verse 27. He goes over the principles of the Lord's Supper. And in the Lord's Supper, as he points out here, that these believers, as they partake of it, as all believers partake of the Lord's Supper, they are to do so in remembrance of Christ. And that's not merely remembering that he died on the cross. That's part of it. But what he did in dying on the cross and what it means to be in the new covenant and in particular, what it means to be in the New Covenant in this context with other believers. One family. And he says in verse 27, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an, and notice this, unworthy manner. It's the exact same Greek word that Paul used in Colossians chapter 1, verse 10, translated there, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, with one single exception. In this case, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it is preceded with a negation, meaning, as translated here, unworthy. And what was happening? 
They were coming together as a single body of believers, purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, made one body and one with Him, and they were despising other parts of the very body that belonged to Christ. Some were coming and hungry, and they were being despised. Others were even coming drunk, intoxicated. They were not living in a manner worthy of Christ whom they professed. What we see in essence here is a rebuke to what should be the characteristic of people. You belong to Christ, walk in a manner worthy of Jesus Christ. I'll ask you to turn to another text of Scripture. Rome, or excuse me, the book of John, and there to John chapter 8. We'll spend a few minutes here in John 8 looking at this same principle. Jesus, knowing those who have come to him and those who have professed a belief in him, from uh, the preceding verses, in the preceding verses um, being primarily verse 30 and those that had heard him. In verse 30, the text says, As he spoke though these things, many came to believe in him. So Jesus was saying to those who had believed in him. So now Christ is speaking to those who have professed a belief in him, those who believed in him. And he said, if you continue in my word, in verse 31, then are you truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. What I would like you to see, starting out right here in verse 31, is notice, if you continue in my word, and then the fact that verse 32 says, you will know the truth, and that truth will make you free. The word, word here, continuing in Christ's word, is synonymous with continuing in the truth and knowing the truth. His word is truth. God's word is truth. We know that from John 17, 17. But notice as this goes on, Jesus knew something about many of these professors that were before him. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Now notice verse 31 or excuse me, verse 37. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me. Why? Because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen with my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your father. Notice verse 38 closely. I speak the things, that's Christ's word. Remember, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And now here he says, I speak the things which I have seen with my father. So in essence, my word is the father's word. My word that I'm speaking to you is what I have with the father. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from. And notice this, your father. So he's making a distinction. He goes on. They answered and said to, him, said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you, abide, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. Notice this. If you belong to Abraham, then do what? Do the deeds of Abraham. You see this connection. If you belong to me, you're going to hear and do my word. If you continue in my word, then are you disciples of mine, right? You see that connection. And if you are connected, you will be doing it. There is no doubt about it. Notice as the text goes on. 
Verse 40, but as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your father. They said to him, we were not born of fornication. They were getting the point. And so they're rebuking him here. We have one father. I mean, I can almost hear them stomping their feet whenever they make that proclamation. We have one father. And notice what they say. They don't say Abraham here. They say God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceed forth and have come from God, for I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You see, all of this really that he's dialoguing with these individuals goes back to what he said. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed? You know the truth and the truth will make you free. You can't. Follow me here. Notice what he's saying. Or you do not understand because you cannot hear my word. He goes on in verse 44 and says, You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. In just a little bit, Jesus is going to tell these people that they are liars. He says, though, first in verse 45, But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What is it that Christ spoke? He spoke that which he had seen with the Father. The Father's words are true. Christ's words are the words in essence of the Father, and they are true. And if you do not obey them, you are not of the Father, yet you have a Father, and that Father, according to verse 44, is the devil. Which one of you, in verse 46, convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God, notice this, hears the words of God. And this, and for this reason, or for this reason, you do not hear them because you are not of God. Verse 49. I do not have a demon, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. Notice Christ saying here, I'm speaking the Father's words. And in doing that, what is he in essence doing? Follow this closely with me. He honors the Father. Those who belong to Christ walk in a manner worthy of Christ. Not in order to belong to Him, but because they already belong to Him. Christ is saying, it's such a natural thing for me to honor God because I am from Him, I am of Him, and in essence, He is God. Notice verse 51, Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, and the prophets also. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Surely you are not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. And you have not come to know him, but, to, but I know him. And if I say that I do not know him, I will be a liar like you, and I do know him and keep his word. You see a very similar thing whenever we look back at the text, and will not now, we already have to 1 John chapter 2. If someone says they know him, 
what are they going to do? They're going to obey him. Jesus says, I know him, that is my father, in verse 55, and keep his word. Paul is saying in Colossians chapter 1, here's the reason why you need to know God's will. So that you will walk in a manner worthy of him, of Christ Jesus the Lord. So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. So important for us. Now, we can say that properly representing the Lord Jesus, not in order to know Him, but because one does know Him, is the ultimate reason for knowing God's will. As opposed to the idea of the priority for knowing the will of God being for our own end. It's actually for His. One other thing that I would like us to acknowledge in this text, I believe that is vital for us, and I'm going to ask you to go back to Colossians 1 with me. Notice again, and we're looking at the connection between the request and the reason for the request. The request being that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Listen closely now, and beloved, don't miss this. This is really precious, I believe, from this text. From the fact that the Christian is to know the will of God, so that he or she will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. We can also deduce, or in a simple phrase, reasonably conclude, that knowing and understanding the will of God is not something God makes difficult for the believer. So often our minds would lead us to think, oh, knowing God's will is hard. Coming to know it is difficult. It's just so painstaking. And excuse after excuse after excuse. And some have even asked the question, why does God make knowing His will so difficult? But the fact of the matter is, God has not made His, or knowing His will, difficult. Think about it this way. The idea of knowing God's will here, the ultimate reason behind it, as we have looked at in this text, is so that we could walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Now think about it this way. God, according to Matthew chapter 3, is well pleased with His Son. Matthew 3, 17. This is my beloved Son, God said, in whom I am well pleased. And then again in Matthew 17, verse 5, God said to the Son, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear Him. And think about this, beloved. What is it that God is doing in your life and my life right now? He is at work in the Holy Spirit, conforming us to the very image of His Son in whom He is well pleased. He is pleased with the life of a person who honors His Son. And since it is the knowledge of His will that is instrumental in one walking in a manner worthy of His Son, God will not withhold not the knowledge of His will from such a person who pursues God's will in God's terms. God isn't holding out His will in front of us like a dangling carrot or a beefsteak in front of a dog pulling a wagon. He's not doing that. God genuinely wants us and desires His people to know His will, not just because He's commanded it, and that He has, 
but so that in knowing His will, we honor His Son. So He's not going to make that difficult. And that should be a great blessing to us as His people. Now, whenever we go back to John chapter 8, and we began to examine that text, we recognize that in order to know God's will, you're going to have to know His Word. And the difficulty isn't that God has held back revelation from His people that He wants them to know, but the difficulty is that in order to know it, they're going to have to be disciplined in and with His Word. And that's not God's problem. That's our situation. That's where we are. So if we're going to know God's will, we're going to have to spend time in His Word. And we can rest assured that as we spend time in His Word, then we're going to know His will. And as we know His will, it is ultimate that in knowing His will, we'll be walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. The Word works in the lives of those who believe. And in particular, it works to conform God's people to the image of Christ. To cause them to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. That's why the Apostle Paul, after verse 12, begins to elaborate in Colossians chapter 1 on the knowledge that is associated with Jesus Christ. He teaches them. He knows if they're going to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, they're going to have to know the truth regarding Christ. And in order to know that truth regarding Christ, Paul's logical reasoning would be, we're going to write it to them. And the Holy Spirit moved in his life and caused him to pen this epistle and God has preserved it for us. What a praise that is. What a praise it is. Well, we have looked at the request. We have seen the reason. As the Lord wills next week, we will look at the result. And the result is condensed basically into two things. And that is, God is pleased. God is pleased. And that only makes sense. We looked at or mentioned Matthew 3.17 and Matthew 17.5. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. If, if you know God's will and the result of that is you're walking in a manner worthy of the Lord, then you're going to please God. What a praise that is. That's what pleases Him. And then secondly, the believer is perfected. God is pleased, the believer perfected. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank You. Thank You for the simplicity of Your Word. It's not too high. It's not too low. It's right here. And your Holy Spirit indwells us so that we may know it and comprehend it and live it out. Calls us to see, to understand, to live it out to the praise of your glory. Thank you for Jesus, for his death on the cross, for his resurrection, for his return. Thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit who gives new life and causes us to see Christ and the fact that He is indeed worthy of our allegiance in every way. In His name we pray. Amen.